Doug, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Pray podcast today. My pleasure. Great to be here. I'm glad you're here. Can you give myself and the audience a little bit of background about who you are and what you do? Um, yeah, well, I've spent most of my professional life in the fraud fighting world. I was uh, uh, an investigator back in the 80s for the state attorney general's office here in Seattle. Uh, and I did that for about 10 years and kind of got frustrated with, you know, the I, I could just never really catch anyone. <laughs> um, or if we did, we drove them out of town but couldn't get their money back. So, you know, I, I basically went to the AG and said, is there any way I could start doing some consumer ed and get to the people before the scammer does? And I've sort of been doing that ever since. I, I went from there to AARP, and I spent 30 years at AARP, the last 20 as a state director in Washington State. Um, but also developing a lot of fraud prevention educational materials. And I retired in um, the end of 2022, and now I just do consulting, but very similar type of work, going around giving talks about fraud prevention. Gotcha. And I, I know that you do some work in the uh, robocall space as well. What got you interested in that space? Or is that just because it's the, the beginning portion of scams? Um, well, that's part of the reason I was interested in it. Uh, about five years ago, I got a call from this producer I'd used, I used to work with um, who said, have you heard about this kid up at Long Island, New York, who has invented a way to stop robocalls? And I'm like, no, I haven't heard of this. And she introduced me to Aaron Foss, who is the founder of Nomo Robo. And Aaron, in 2013, the federal, this is how far back the robocall problem goes. In 2013, the Federal Trade Commission issued a, a design challenge for the person who could come up with the best solution to block robocalls. And Aaron won that challenge and started his company with the $20,000 that they gave him. To, oh, wow. Um, and, and his idea, which has been copied by many other companies now, is he went to the phone companies and he said, he said, well, first of all, how do we identify these calls? We can't block them until we identify them. Well, he went to the phone company and he said, do you have any old mothballed phone lines I could buy? And they're like, yeah, we have tons of them. We'll give them to you for next to nothing. And he buys 350,000 phone lines and he runs them all into a computer. And then when he sees a phone number that has a point of origin and is calling more than, say, 10 numbers in his, they call it the honeypot. Yeah. <laughs> um, he puts that into a blacklist database as a robocall. And when, so when I call you, Chris, if you have this app on your phone, um, before the phone rings, it'll it'll compare my number to the blacklist database. And if there's a match, it'll block it. And that's how he blocks the, the calls. But my interest was when I started talking to Aaron and actually went up there and visited him in his world headquarters, which at the time was the second bedroom in his <laughs> house in, on Long Island. Um, he not only blocks all the calls, he records them all and transcribes them all, millions of them. And as a fraud researcher and somebody who's always trying to figure out how they do it and tracking persuasion methods and everything, this just seemed like a gold mine to me. And so while even while I was still at AERP, we partnered with Nomo Robo to start tracking these calls as they come in. We did a bunch of speeches during the pandemic, Zoom calls with people. So, you know, we're calling into Bellingham, Washington, or you name the city, Orange County. And he can pinpoint the calls coming into Orange County right now in real time. So it's current and it's local. Uh, and we did that for quite a while. Then when I retired, he, I said, I'm not sure what I'm going to do now. And he goes, well, why don't you come to work for Noma Robo? So I've been sitting here at you know, my house in Seattle monitoring <laughs> 150,000 phone calls. Um, and it is interesting. There's there's a lot of uh, interesting things we could we could say about it. One, one thing that I've noticed back about 15 years ago, I did a study with a guy named Anthony Prakanas, University of California, uh, who is an expert in persuasion tactics, influence. He's written a number of books. And we got a hold of a database that the Ohio AG's office gave us of these types of calls where the investigator goes to a senior, typically a senior, who's got tons of calls coming in and says, will you mind if you we forward your phone line to my desk? And I'll take the calls and pretend to be the victim. 
and we'll record all those calls. We had five or 600 of these tapes that they gave us and we analyzed them. And the overwhelming most common tactic used is what we, back then we called it phantom fixation. I'm calling it promise of financial gain. You've won Publishers Clearinghouse. You could get a 10 to one return on an investment for no risk, financial gain promises. Um, and that was but that was 99% of the calls, scam calls. Now what we're finding is when we monitor those same calls, there are still those, you know, publishers clearing out imposters are still out there. Um, but almost half of them are what I would call the threat of loss. So there's, there's these two buckets. There's the promise of gain and there's the threat of loss. Almost 50% of the calls now are, Someone charged twelve hundred dollars on your Amazon account. Yeah. Call it right away, or you've got a virus on your computer. They're going to eliminate everything on your computer. Things that put you into this space of being scared. And either one of them follows the the, um, the strategy that all the scammer. We've interviewed probably two dozen scammers. I have over you know the years. And when you ask these scammers, what is your primary strategy? to hook these people? What's the first thing you're trying to do? And they all give you the same answer. And that answer is get the victim under the ether. And at first we're we're going, well, that's not a very scientific term. We're going to have to call it something else. What do you mean by ether? Ether is a heightened emotional state where you're no longer thinking logically with the neocortex, but you're reacting emotionally with the amygdala part of your brain, right? You get them and it doesn't matter if the emotion is a negative emotion or a positive emotion, either one distorts your thinking enough that they can more easily manipulate you. So when you think of these two buckets with the robocalls, I've won $8 million and $5,000 a day in a Mercedes. That gets me into that heightened emotional state. Yeah. Or I'm going to lose everything on my computer. That gets me into a negative emotional state. And We've done studies. We did a study with Stanford about 10 years ago testing this ether theory. I don't know how to do this, but people in white lab coats at Stanford were able to help us with this. They bring 200 people in and they give them a rigged game that puts them artificially into one of these conditions. I forget what it's the monetary incentive delay game or something. Anyway, in one condition, you start out winning a bunch of money and then you gradually lose all of it, right? That puts you in a negative state. In another condition, you start out losing and then you gradually gain it all back and that puts you into a positive state. And they're taking their pulse and, you know, saliva tests, I don't know, whatever, however else you might want to measure this. But then once they're in that state, um, we had them review advertisements from the Federal Trade Commission cases where they'd use deceptive ads and the hypothesis was the people in the heightened emotional state are more likely to say they'd go for these deceptive ads than a group that we didn't do it to, that yeah. was just under no emotion. And of course, that's what, exactly what we found. And there didn't seem to be any difference whether you were in an emotionally high state, happy or sad. So I think that's part of what's underlying all of this fraud business, whether it's robocalls or email or texts or pop-ups, you know, those are sort of the four big channels. Um, it's all designed in the short run to get you into this heightened emotional state so that you're reacting intuitively and based on your gut, which is always a bad move if you're talking about a scammer. <laughs> it, it, it makes, so are there, are there uh, pardon the phrase, prophylactics to get, prevent us from getting into an emotional state? This is the interesting thing. And, you know, a lot of the conversation in my world and probably your world, so this is your world too, Chris, um, in the fraud space is, oh my God, AI is just going to annihilate us. It's already hard to tell who's what's real and what isn't. And AI is going to make it even more difficult. Well, yeah, it is going to make it more difficult. Um, but, but the technology can also help us get out of it. I have been preaching lately and preaching is not the word, suggesting (laughs) that we do this thing called hardening the target. You know, if it's really hard to tell whether someone's legit or not, or if you're somebody who's prone to getting into that heightened emotional state anyway, when you're in response, 
just block the incoming attacks to begin with. Yeah. So get a robocall blocking app on your phone. Or if you don't want to do that, go to your phone company and see what better way they have to block it. Um, you know, make sure you're updating your computer software, freeze your credit, monitor your bank account, all the things that these identity theft companies trying to sell you for $29.95 monitoring services, they, they'll do. And there's nothing wrong with those companies. I, I liken it to, you know, some people like to cook their own meals, save a few bucks, do it themselves. Others go out to a restaurant. And that's kind of the way this is. You can do, the technology exists now for relatively inexpensively. I mean, bank monitoring, you know, if you have online access to your bank accounts and you have alerts that alert you, I have a credit card where anytime anyone, including me, uses it, I get an email saying you used it above your limit of zero. It's free. I mean, they don't want, the banks don't want anybody messing with your account as, any more than you do. So there are technological tools that I think can, block the incoming the difficulty for our people and i say our people meaning the seniors because i'm a senior now and you know i used to think why do people answer the phone at all i mean when i was working i was trying to run away from phone yeah. call get away from me 200 emails a day you know but you know what happens chris when you retire the phone stops ringing you know and you go i can go a whole day here without the phone ringing once except four o'clock in the afternoon and I'm like, hey, I wonder who that is. So I'm picking them up, right? And after, now I get it. it. Now I get it. It's a, it, You have to put yourself in the shoes of someone. Uh, the problem is that it's still really dangerous to answer those phone calls because a lot of them are really persuasive and really good. And, and you think, well, what's the harm? I mean, I've been taking these phone calls kind of to set them up and make recordings of, of the bad guys. Um, but I'm as cynical as I get. Plus, I know going in, I'm not going to do it, right? There's yeah. zero chance that I'm going to do what they say. Uh, you don't want to try that at home. It may sound fun, but it's kind of like those ads where you see the brace car going up a steep hill. And, and there's a little Langton bond that says, don't try this. <laughs> professional driver. Professional driver on a closed course. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. You don't want to do that. So. Um, those are some of the ways, and I think with the, with the emotion thing, um, another study we did, this is the last study I did when I was at AARP, we surveyed 3,000 people who had encountered a fraud. This was with, I think, NORC, and we did this with NORC. And 2,000 of them were able to resist and not lose money. 1,000 of them lost money. What's the difference between those two groups? That's what we wanted to know. Yeah. And one of the big, because for years, we'd done surveys and, oh my God, trying to find out the demographic profile of who is most vulnerable to these types of scams, right? Is it older people? A lot of time, for a long time, it was just all older people yeah. are the most vulnerable to all scams. But we know that's not true now. Um, in fact, younger people overall, in general, have a higher incidence of victimization overall than older people do. Older people are more susceptible to sweepstakes and certain scams. But we just couldn't find a demographic profile. It wasn't education. It wasn't race. It wasn't age. What we found in this study is that the people who lost money had twice as many, had experienced twice as many stressful life events mm -hmm. in the months preceding the encounter compared to the people who were able to resist. And the idea there, I think, is that when you're caring for a level, when you're a caregiver or you're sick yourself or you just got divorced, managing those stressful events takes up a lot of cognitive capacity that might otherwise allow you to defend against these things or at least see them coming. Mm -hmm. And you get blindsided by them. And you're also much more inclined to get emotional in response to a pitch because you're sort of already on the edge anyway. Mm -hmm. And and so I think it's real. And there's nothing you can do about that. I mean, everybody has these moments. Uh, older people tend to have a, more of them just because they get sick more, and they're you know people are dying and so forth. But everybody has these moments. And so if you're experiencing a lot of stress, that's the time to be especially vigilant. I would say about not answering the phone or not responding. Interesting. I I was thinking back to when you were, you were talking about AI. 
and this kind of fear of AI is going to be pouring fuel on the fire of every scam, fraud, cybersecurity incident. It's it's you know uh, going to go crazy. Ha- has and, and if you can't tell me that this is that's fine. Uh, has Nomo Robo started to use AI? In talk in on their in their honeypot and talking to the scammers in order to to kind of rather than having a bank of people on the phone talking to these scammers trying to figure out what the scammer is can they scale up AI to be the yeah. recipient of the scam calls to draw out and see the profile to kind of see what the stories are yeah yeah it's funny you should say that because this started several years ago. Um, you know, because the, the landscape has changed in the RoboDial world where um, the FCC is cracking down on them. There's a 50-state coalition trying to sue all these bad guys. So they're getting better at hiding. You know, we used to see one phone number call a 1,000 numbers, yeah. but that's too easy to identify. So now they just buy these direct inward dial numbers, DID, I think they're called, by the millions and one number calls one number yeah. and then they're done one number calls one number that gets it because re- before we used to say oh look there's this guy right over here in buffalo new york and he's pulling the grandparent scam send me all of those every call he makes send them to me and i'll set up the grandparent and that worked beautifully we yeah. got all kinds of it but it, that stopped so what we ended up doing was creating several different bots that answer the phone in in different ways. Aaron has a an, an uncle, <laughs> and he had literally engaged him in recording different responses, kind of like a soundboard. I don't know if your mm-hmm. audience what the soundboard technology is like, but the soundboards are. Um, can I go into that for a minute? Yeah, or? let's go for it. Let's go for it. Okay, okay. Because um, this is a pet peeve of mine. I, I ask an audience, how many of you have gotten a call in the last? week asking to donate money to a fireman's fund or the police guild or the national police force like there is such a thing every hand goes up everybody gets these calls and the calls are all it always sounds like you know a deep voice a guy who sounds like a sheriff from somewhere in the midwest hi this is john smith and i'm you know the reality is that you're probably talking to a boiler room somewhere in indonesia or in india and what they do is they record 35 or 40 different messages, response messages, and they have this board that just has a little buttons on it that says, thanks. And you press that and, and the and the deep voice says, thanks. You're not really talking to that sheriff who sounds yeah. like from the Midwest. In fact, the person you're talking to may not speak English very well even. Um, well, we started doing that with the honeypot just to try and because we were getting a lot of calls where if it wasn't really a live person picking up, they just hang up and you yeah. lose. Them. So we tried different versions of that. And um, Aaron's uncle's voice did the best. And all of a sudden we started getting these just, because he would go on and he would, it was very cleverly designed to not say yes and not say no, but just, Oh, wait a minute, let me get a pencil and paper. I'm going to be, you know, and and it it allowed us to find out more about what was going on, and so now we have the ability to see these calls coming in, and if we want to, we can we can sort of barge in and take over those calls and play them out. Another thing that we've been learning about, uh, um, we, I mentioned the uh, change from promises of wealth to threats of loss. I did, I did this analysis uh, a couple months ago out in the honeypot calls. You have, you know, 100,000 calls coming in in a day. And we did this analysis where we tried to separate spam calls yeah. from scam calls. And we would define a spam call as admittedly an unwanted phone sales message. But it's someone selling an actual product or service. Yeah. You know, it's like Medigap insurance or funeral insurance or some, or, you know, solar panel. I want a salesman to come out to your house to sell you solar, right? So they're not frauds. They're just sales calls from the fraud calls. And when you divide them into those two buckets, 
95% of the spam calls are promises of financial gains. You're mm. going to get some financial gain from it, and only 5% are these threats of loss. Whereas when you analyze the scam calls, it's 50-50. That means anytime you get any call from anyone who is threatening you with something, the chances are very high that it's a scam call. This becomes the number one red flag, I think, out there for it. Because if, if there really is a crisis like that, you're not going to get them calling you with a robocall vo voice, right? Yeah. It's going to be the bank sending you a, a certified letter or a, maybe an email to call back, but independently call back, you know. So that um, has become something we've built into our consumer education now. If, if you get a call and it's threatening you at all, you can check it out, independently check it out, but do not respond one of the most insidious ones is these tech support yeah. um, pop-ups that people get. I asked the audience that, and they're like, oh, my God. Every single time, there's at least one person who's gotten that pop-up. You're on your computer. You're minding your own business. A pop-up comes saying, oh, my God, it's Microsoft. You have a virus on your computer. And if you don't call this number right away, it's going to erase everything on your computer. Yeah. And if you don't know better... So let's skip to the right advice. The first thing to know is if that happens, unplug your computer. Just press the power button down for five seconds and reboot it, and it'll go away. Right? Why? Because that's really just a little piece of JavaScript that probably got downloaded when you were on some website and you clicked on an ad and embedded in that ad is a little piece of JavaScript, and a week later a pop-up happens, and, it, and there's nothing. It's benign. Yeah. Unless you call the number. And so if you don't know that, though, you're freak out. And and by the way, the message is saying, whatever you do, don't turn off your computer. Yeah. yeah. Um, then you then you're now you're talking to a boiler room in India that claims to be Windows support team or whatever. And um, that's so that's a really important tip. And again, it's a threat of loss kind of approach. And uh, people freak out. They go into the the ether, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I probably the most convincing call I got was from someone claiming to be from my power company. And they had forged the caller ID of the power company. And normally I wouldn't have known it, but I had just called it the, the day prior for some legitimate issue. Uh, and so I recognized it as, as, the, as the phone number and as hey, this is, we're calling from the power company. And if you don't pay your bill, it's gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're on the way to shut off the power right now if you don't pay with gift cards. It, it ultimately where it got, but I was, I was in some sense surprised that they had actually started to use, they had actually used the caller ID, forged the caller ID of the organization that they were claiming to be. And that actually happened to a friend of mine just recently. He got a phone call from what he thought was his bank with the, caller ID being the 800 number of his bank and, oh, we need you to do this and this and log into your account and, okay, give us this. We're, we're going to, to make sure you're the right person on the line, we're going to send you the six-digit security code uh, and just read it back to us. And at some point, he's like, what? No, 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 no. He immediately got, at some point in the process, he realized this is, this is something wrong here, called the bank, you know, Changed it, uh, changed the username, changed the password, changed all of his account numbers and everything. But because it was the caller ID was one of the things that that uh, would have been a, a a red flag to him. But because the caller ID was right, it was that kind of reinforcement that it was a legitimate call. Absolutely. Um, and this is another big thing I try and tell people is how many of you in the audience believe that Caller ID will tell you who is calling. <laughs> and um, every single hand goes up. And I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> Why? Because it's so easy to spoof. And I gave them the example of, I have this thing called Spoof Card, which is just an app that's on my phone. I think I paid $5 to download it, download some amount of calls. And, and there's a ton of these. This is just one example. And on this app, it has a line that says the number you want to call, so I could put your number yep. in. And right below it, it has a line that says the number you want to appear when the phone rings. 
And you can put any number you want in there. And that's the number now. Now, now again, the FCC has uh, clamped down a little bit, and they have this new law it's, or this new list called the "Do Not Originate" list. And certain government agencies, like the Social Security Administration yeah. number, the IRS number, FTC, some of these government agencies have been spoofed or on that. Which means all it really means is if you get caught using it, spoofing the social security number and they catch you, there's more penalties, but they still do it. And how do I know that? Because we get caller ID on all 350,000 phone lines and the Medicare 1-800 number is on the do not originate call list. And I get that showing up all the time. Every day. It, what, I, what I don't understand, and you're more familiar with the system, is why, why caller ID can even be spoofed. So if I am a business and I own this block of, uh, of DID numbers, why can't I say phone calls from my organization will only come from this provider? Don't ever allow someone to use a caller ID from a different provider pretending to be my organization. I think it's a matter of how difficult it is. It's whack-a-mole. It's hard to enforce. Yeah. Well, um, no, I mean like a technical solution, like the call just won't even connect. Yeah. But who does that? Who, yeah. who who refuses? And they are going after these telephone companies that are the middlemen mm -hmm. that are facilitating all of these scam operations. But there's so many of them, and they're global. They're all over the world that it's really a challenge. Um, some people have asked me before, why is it legal to spoof a number at all to begin yeah. with? That's kind of what you're asking, too. Well, and, I, I, and I, I work for a company that made a bunch of phone calls, and I think I know the answer to it, but I'll let you answer it. Well, I mean, there's some legitimate, like if you're a psychotherapist, you're a therapist, or you're a medical person, and or you're a doctor, maybe, um, and you want to call your patient because uh, there's a prearrangement for a call. My doctor does this all the time. I make an arrangement and she's calling me from her personal cell phone, but I don't think that's the number. I think she has a number that she can use to disguise. Yeah. She doesn't want her personal cell phone out there, you know? So I think there's probably legitimate usage. This is true for all the technological developments, right? Is that there are always, legitimate uses for all of it it's just the clever scammers who figure out well if they could do that for that reason then i can do this for yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> so. yeah i mean like one of the challenges with the the, the built-in call blocking on phones where it's uh don't accept calls that aren't in my contact list just send those ones straight to to my uh, to the voicemail well if my doctor's office has 16 outbound lines and they're not fake and they're not faking the caller id on it those other you know those other 15 numbers aren't in my contacts list yeah exactly right so you and, might call that's important and those are the calls that are important saying here's the results of your test or, yeah. or whatever the case is that's a call that you want or if it's your kid's school or these sort of things where the the outbound call might not be coming from the same number as the inbound call uses yeah no it's really true yeah i mean i i got into the point where i just try and tell people any any contact any incoming i get whether it's an email a text a, a pop-up or a robocall that i did not initiate i assume is a scam yeah i just assume it is and if it bothers me because it's my bank and my money's in my bank i can always independently log on to my bank account and and find out if everything's fine or amazon you know the the, the most frequently spoofed um brands right now are medicare mm -hmm. amazon and spectrum which is a phone provider i think do you have comcast down where you are uh, yeah cox compass spectrum yeah they're all available in various places down here i got a call last week or a couple weeks ago and i actually played this i actually recorded this call <laughs> um it was, I noticed in the honeypot that um, we were just getting bombarded with, hi, this is Comcast and you can get 90% off on your bill. And I mean, the, when this happens, there's thousands of them at a time, tens of thousands of them. And so I said, I'm going to start taking those calls. And I took one <laughs> 
And the guy answers, and, he, and and then what's amazing is they've copied Comcast's intake system. So it sounds mm -hmm. just like you would hear if you were calling Comcast. That part's really spooky. Press one if you want to talk to a technician. Press two if you, I mean, it's a yeah. pinnacle, you know. So I press three to talk to somebody, and I say, well, I'm, I'm calling you about the 90% discount. And the guy goes, the what? 90? And I think he was on to me because then he goes, I'm like, maybe I'm mistaken. And he goes, maybe you were mistaken. <laughs> who do you think you are, Barack Obama? And for some reason, he said, who do you think you are, Barack Obama? And I'm like, so I finally said, okay, well, how long have you been scamming people? And he goes, oh, for years. I mean, he just admitted that he was scamming people. And I'm like, well, do you enjoy it? And he goes, oh, very much so. I very much enjoy it. And I go, well, how do you make money off of this? How much, Do you suck a lot of people into this? He goes, I'm not going to talk to you about it. And I'm like, I just want to know how, how, you, how you make money. And he goes, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. Scamming is my art. <laughs> and if you can't figure out how I make money, then you're bleepity bleepity. <laughs> I never, I mean, usually, you know, when you confront somebody like that, they just hang up. Yeah. But he was very feisty and argumentative and just perfectly willing to say, I've been scamming people for years. I love it. <laughs> it's my art. It's my profession. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I can, I can kind of understand it that if you're running a, a scam call center out of out of Bangalore, you're not super worried about the guy in Southern California or right the pacific southwest you're not concerned about whether or not they really know you're a scammer it's they're not going to be at that you know joe consumer is not going to come you know flying halfway across the world <laughs> no they're not this is another interesting you know there's some debate about this but i have said for a long time that um scammers tend not to be there are examples and you were talking off off camera about some examples where the workers are being exploited yeah some cases murdered but by and large it's been my belief that the scammers don't do that kind of violence because you know like for example years ago there was a woman who this jamaican left a message saying do you want me to come over there and burn your house down this really scared her legitimately scared her and i could, all i could say was they're not going to do that I, I'm maybe I'm wrong and maybe it's gotten worse, but I haven't seen the evidence of it because these scammers follow the path of least resistance. Yeah. They are lazy and it takes a lot of work to kill someone. You know, you got to go over there. You got to find a gun. I'm, I'm being a, sort of facetious about it, but, but really I've interviewed enough of these guys where they're like, look, if, if they don't want to go for it right away, I'm on to the next. Yeah. I just want the money. I don't really want to kill people. I just want money and I don't want to work very hard for it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So don't feel like resisting or hanging up um, is is going to put you in, necessarily in harm's way. It's best to just not deal with them. Are, are there any new kind of emerging trends that you're seeing? I mean, kind of like the Amazon one has been, hey, the Amazon, uh, someone bought something on your Amazon account that you didn't buy. That one's been around for for years, along with the social security and the we're going to shut your power off, and you've got a virus. Yeah. Any any new interesting ones or ones that have kind of surprised you? Well, speaking of AI, I do have a recording. The Publishers Clearinghouse um, imposters were I, I would call them early adopters of AI because I got a recording off of the the honeypot two years ago now three years ago um and it's it's a recording is it like, this is joe biden the president of the united <laughs> states calling to tell you you've won publishers <laughs> right and it was kind of a rough recording it was him it was definitely him and i remember thinking at the time this is the canary in the coal mine here right because then fast forward to you know the night before the New Hampshire primary, and you may have yeah. heard the story about, and there was a really good recording of him calling Democrats, telling them not to turn out to vote so that they would, you know, it was a voter suppression strategy, right? And um, it was done by the other side to try and get 
Democrats to not vote for, I believe, Nikki Haley, so that Trump would get more votes. And um, that, and everybody made a big deal out of that because they thought, okay, on the eve of the real election, we're going to see more and more of that. And there's been other, one of the things I do in my workshops is I have a, um, I have some software called Descript. And mm -hmm. this is, this is just a, you know, I, I think I pay 25 bucks a month for this and it helps me edit videos and sound files and so forth. But it also has a pretty sophisticated AI. And what I did was I, I wrote a paragraph about how to avoid identity theft. And I read it into a microphone, just like we would normally write, you know, record a message. But then I also had tr the script trained to my voice. I They gave me a 15-minute script. I read this 15-minute script into the app and then um, applied that technology to the paragraph I had written and pressed a button and it's me talking and it sounds just like me. And I go in front of audiences with these two examples the old way, right? Yeah. And the new way. And pe they cannot tell the difference, right? It's not uncommon for the AI generated version to have 75% of the people think it's that's the real, the real me. So if there's anything new, I think that's the frontier is it's going to be harder and harder to tell who's real and who isn't. And as the technology gets better, you know, the, the, you probably saw those fakes of, uh, Tom Cruise, yeah, right on online. Well, it's up until now, it's just been people where their face and voice are out online a lot. Yeah, but if now you only need like fifteen seconds of a voice to do it, now you could envision a time when someone could take you know m one of my kids' recordings on TikTok and imitate the voice and call with the grandparents' skin. Yep, something like that. And that's I think the real fear is that the anybody can use AI, that means all the scammers can use it. And it's it's gonna get dicey. Are, are you seeing any of the the kind of the grandparent scam come in on the honey pots or are those just so spear fishy that they're the kind of they don't really surface to the top? Well, like I said before, before they started this business where um, they were just using one number to call one number, I've got all kinds of recordings of, of grandparent scammers calling, and it's unbelievable. I mean, I, there was one day where I talked to five different fake lawyers, <laughs> you know, because the first call is, you know, grandpa, I got in an accident, I was at a wedding, and I got pulled over for drunk driving, and I hit my nose, which is why you can't tell that it's not yeah. really because my voice is different. But 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 I'm in jail and I can't talk any longer. So here's the number of my lawyer. Call my call my lawyer right away. They all that's how they all roll because they don't they realize they don't really sound like Johnny or Janie. Or yeah. Whatever. So then now you're talking to the lawyer and the lawyer is just giving you the same story and it's going to take five thousand dollars in bail money, but you know you'll get the money back. And by the way, can you wire it to me right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have all, all kinds of recordings like that of the grandparents rent scam is a, alive and well and when you think about this whole business of ether um now i've interviewed grandparents scam victims where they said you know normally later we looked at we said, why did we do that that's not like us but when johnny my grandson calls we act first and ask questions later yeah yeah it's my grandson i will do and i i have two grandchildren now too i I get this, you know, if I thought they were in trouble, I, maybe I'd sniff around a little more than that guy did, but not much, not if I think they're in danger. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's the challenge is once you've been from the outside, it's easy to look at someone and say, I don't understand logically how you got there and why you did the things that you did. And the issue is, well, that's right, because it's not about logic. It's about shoving a putting enough pressure on someone to get them to act emotionally and not out of logic. And then, you know, once you think that someone's acting emotionally, of course the the process makes sense of, of why they did what they did. That's right. And um, this is why a big challenge in the fraud prevention world is 
there's this thing called the illusion of invulnerability. You know, in the health sciences for years, this has been true, right? It's like people say, I understand that people get cancer, but I never will. Yeah. The illusion of invulnerability. Well, if you never think you're going to get cancer, then you're never going to do anything to prevent yourself from getting cancer. And you're more likely to paradoxically to get cancer. And the same is true with the fraud space. Um, people want to think they're smart enough to fall for it, to not fall for it or whatever. You reminded me of uh, my colleague, Anthony Prakanas, who taught right down there where you are in Santa Cruz, University of California. I think he's retired now. But he used to say about this, when people say, I can't believe you fell for that, think of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. This is the story, so I, I don't want to take credit for it, but you know, you go into that boat and you suspend your disbelief and you believe all the things. That's really the pirate. That's really Johnny Depp. Oh, no, that's the pirate, right? But if you're in that restaurant right across from watching all these crazy people in the boat going, that's the pirate, you think, who are these crazy people? How do they believe any of that? Well, that's because you're not having your emotions manipulated, right? You're not suspending your belief for that short amount of time. You want to be in that fantasy world. Yeah. And so it's just really hard to convince people that this could happen to them for all of those reasons. Um, and we've been, we've had that challenge for a long time. Thankfully now fraud is a bigger problem that we no longer have to convince law enforcement yeah. to make it a priority. Everybody thinks it's a threat now. So. Do, you, do you generally find that law enforcement is more responsive now than they were, let's just say 10 years ago? Yes, they are. And it's no fault of theirs that they weren't as much, 10 years ago is all kinds of crime and their jobs are really hard. And I used to be one of them. So, and my wife still is, my wife's an investigator now, even to this day. So I sympathize with it, but now it's such a direct threat to the, just not, not just to consumers, but to every business. In, in some ways it's more threatening to the business community because there's these things called business email compromises. Yeah. Which you've heard of, you know, where what you're trying to do is you there's a lot more money to be made by scamming the employee of a big company yeah. into handing over the HR list or something, you know, than there is just you or I as individuals. Um, and so that's where all of the energy is is being placed now is is uh almost every company I know sends out fake emails, fake phishing emails, you know, to try and test their employees to see if they're going to fall for them or not. And it's funny because some of the fraud fighters, I fell for one, you know, a couple of times. It looks so real. It was kind of embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but I think it's important. I mean, like you were talking earlier about once you in this position of, I don't think I can fall for this stuff, you're actually at a, a disadvantage. Yeah. And, I think it's important if people like you or I say, hey, we didn't catch it 100% of the time. Because if you and I who have been in this space for, for years, or in your case, decades, can't get it 100% of the time, a consumer who this isn't their occupation, this isn't their interest, shouldn't feel bad about themselves for getting it wrong once. Right. I, that's, you know, I'll give you an example. During the pandemic, um, I was very freaked out early on. Remember how there was shortages of everything, but yeah. shortages of masks. I went onto Facebook. I saw this display ad on Facebook that said you could get the free masks for, I don't know, $30. <laughs> um, but you could get them like in two days, right? And I went for it and it was a total scam. I didn't get, I got nothing. I had $30, yeah. goodbye, right? What was going on there? Sure, I'm a fraud fighter, but we're right in the middle of a pandemic. I'm afraid my family is all going to get COVID. And at that point, getting COVID meant you're really sick. And if you're elderly, you might even die, right? So I'm in the ether. Everyone in yeah. the whole country, everyone in the whole world was under the ether. And so the the number of COVID-related yeah. scams that went on is just unbelievable. And then all the COVID relief scams. And oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it just, and that's the challenging thing is that the, the scammers will absolutely take advantage of world events and politics to 
make it relevant in in the, in the moment, or at least the at least the introduction to the scam is relevant in the moment. I mean, I, I had a guy who I'll, shall remain nameless that I interviewed who was a former scammer. And when the pandemic started, he called me in a panic, like this is in June of 2020. Like, what's the, what's the problem? And he goes, I'm I'm really worried that I'm going to go back to the scamming business. And I'm like, why is that? And he goes, because if this had been any other time when I was active, this would be a career ending moment. <laughs> yeah. Because and I'm like, why? Now, explain that to me. He goes, because the government is about to give away more money than they've ever given away. And they're not going to ask many questions. And I could literally make $10 million in the next 12 months, but I'd be doing it the old way and I'd be scamming people and I don't want to. So talk me out of it. Talk me off the ledge, you know? And um, so that was a real sort of wake up call about what we were facing. On the one hand, you had to, you had to, stimulate the economy and you had to put this money out there when the government does that too often there's an awful lot of you know waste that comes with it yeah so. all the bureaucracy and all the uh, all the friction disappears because of the urgency and so therefore the the ability to catch the fraudsters at the beginning of these things goes away i'll tell you another example of it and i this is not AARP talking, my former employee, this is me, Doug Shadell talking, but um, since I've been monitoring these robocalls, the number of Medicare related scammers that are out there um, and the, you know, the durable medical equipment, like you, you could get a back brace or you could get pain meds or you could get a knee brace or you could get a free genetic test. I started looking into this going, what is all of that about? Um, and why is are these people getting away with it? And it turns out that part of the reason Medicare is vulnerable is because when it was created back in the 60s, in order to get it passed, the medical community, basically the doctors, they had to agree to pay every bill that comes in within like 30 days or 60 days, I don't know which one or the yes. other, and ask questions later, right? Yeah. That is enough of a window that so so if you're somebody who's selling these bogus genetic tests, DNA tests, right? These kits, um, you know, you call somebody and I took a bunch of these calls, so I know, I know how they do it. And there was a boiler room in Florida doing it, right? And they had a doctor standing by, willing to ask me two questions <laughs> to qualify me for this genetic kit that Medicare is going to pay for, and it's not going to cost you anything. And if you agree to do it and you answer all their questions, you just talk to the doctor, you might actually get one of these kits, but then they're going to bill Medicare $10,000 yeah. for it, right? And you only have so many of these durable medical equ equipment allotments as a Medicare beneficiary. So you're, it, you're using mm -hmm. one up doing this. Um, plus it's, just bilking the system yeah because medicare has to pay within a short amount of time they are handcuffed to be able to prophylactically uh see if these are scams or not right and billions of dollars well and, and it's the sort of thing that the recipient of the call wouldn't report as a scam because they got the they got the back brace yeah and yeah. where's the crime yeah it, no. it's, it's taking advantage of a system that's reimbursing an organization well beyond the cost of what they provided. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we've got plenty of challenges out there. <laughs> are, are there resources that people can go to to kind of find out what the latest latest threats are, the latest scams, and what they can do about it? I yeah. Know, AARP has put a, a ton of resources available. AARP has um, this thing called the AARP Helpline. And I'll look the number up while we're talking here so we can read it. Or you, maybe you can give it to people over the phone but um, or over the online. Um, basically, it's it's uh, a group of volunteers that we train, and I've been involved in training them. You can call, and if you think you got a call from a scam or you've got victimized and you want some counseling uh, or you want to know where to go for help, you can call this number, and it's free. 
and um, they get something like 2,000 calls a week now. Oh, wow. I mean, this all started back in Orange County, where you are. Um, let me give you that number while we're talking about it. It's 877-908-3360. It's 877-908-3360. And this, this helpline started um, back in the late 90s. I was involved in this thing called the Bat Tax Force in Orange County. Law enforcement had this coalition of law enforcement people that were busting boilers in Orange County. And they'd go in and they would, you know, arrest all the people in the room and they'd seize everything in the room, including the call sheets where they were about to call They're the victim list, basically. Yeah. And somebody got the bright idea, and it wasn't me, but it was a great idea. Why don't we get our coalition of law enforcement together and we'll call those people and we'll warn them because those are the most vulnerable people out there. Those are the people the scammers were about to call. Yeah. Right. It was called a reverse boiler room. And we did this for, I don't know, a couple of years. It felt good, but nobody knew whether it really worked or not. And again, we did the study where we had a control group and we had a group that got called and then we hired a former, a convicted scammer who I found in Texas, used to sell oil wells, to call both groups two weeks after the intervention to see whether the group that got counseling responded at the same rate or less. And they responded 50% less. Mm -hmm. And these were lottery victims, elderly lottery victims. We, we weren't even sure they were going to remember the call, frankly. But not only did they remember the call, but they were responding at a rate of 50% less. So one thing led to another, and eventually that got funded into these helplines that now no longer do outbound calls. They are inbound calls. And so you can call there and get help. Also, just you know, contacting your local AG if you've been victimized is always a good idea to report these things if you get those types of calls. Always report, please report. Even if your case doesn't get solved, at least it helps law enforcement to understand the scope and, and what's going on. Exactly right. Yep. Is there any other advice that you have for the audience as we wrap up here today? No, I think we covered it. That's pretty much the whole landscape. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. My pleasure.